great host, you say? How many? 10,000 strong, at least. 10,000? It is an army bred with a single purpose. To preserve the world of men. I had that idea last night as I was falling asleep, and I realized this morning that this might be the only chance I ever get to use that scene in this context. So, the opportunity could not be missed. Greetings adventurers, I'm Kramer, and today we celebrate, we commemorate the 10,000 of you. I know, I can't believe I'm saying that either. But today, you deserve a drink. Would that I could send one to each and every one of you with a hand-signed card saying thank you, but alas, this recipe is the best I can offer. So today, I drink to you. Today, we make hypocrites. This recipe was inspired by an awesome cookbook called A Feast of Ice and Fire, which is a Game of Thrones-themed cookbook endorsed by George R. R. Martin himself. My copy happens to be an anniversary gift from several years ago because my girlfriend and I enjoy cooking together. So fittingly for this video, she is my special guest. My girlfriend and professional voice actress Gabriel Ashton Brown wanted to do the voiceover for this video so that we can all share in this recipe together uh, to thank you for being part of this community. Say hello, Gabe. Hi, my name is Gabe. Thanks for having me on the channel. How did you do that? She's standing right behind the camera. Anyway, this is getting a little bit meta, but before we get to the cooking, allow me to draw your attention to the description box below because there's a lot of useful information down there that I don't want to get buried, such as the modified and full version of the recipe that we did, the resources for the medicinal properties of all the herbs that we used, links to Gabe's voiceover work, and the link to the cookbook that inspired this video. One take, let's get started. With the ending of Hallow's Eve and the beginning of November, we can be certain of only one thing. Winter is coming. It is this truth and the book of A Feast of Ice and Fire, which has inspired the making of this recipe. Quoted within the pages of this book are the words of another. Le Viandier de Taillevin, 14th century. Hippocras, take four ounces of very fine cinnamon. Two ounces of fine cassia flowers, an ounce of selected mecca ginger, an ounce of grains of paradise, and a sixth of an ounce of nutmeg and galingale combined. Crush them all together, take a good half ounce of this powder and eight ounces of sugar, and mix it with a quart of wine. Our first task is to make this powder. Our ingredients will be slightly different as we have been fortunate enough to find a great many other period spices. It is not necessary that you have them all. There are enough of them that only several will suffice for your wine. If you so desire, note that each of these spices is associated with certain medicinal properties, and let that inform your choice. Some sources for this are linked in the description. This powder will be far more than you need for a single bottle of wine. Feel free to play with the ratios with your own needs, or do as we have done and make a large batch, based on four parts cinnamon to one part all of the other spices, to be saved and used for later. Start with two ounces of cinnamon. One ounce is two tablespoons. Add to it a half ounce or one tablespoon of nutmeg, and the same amount of allspice. In our case, we added just one teaspoon of orange zest. All of these were pre-ground. Our next ingredients we managed to find whole to better keep with the medieval ambiance. Additional ingredients we couldn't find but you might wish to use are listed in the description, along with the rest of the recipe. Of equal parts, all one tablespoon. We add cloves, cardamom pods, black pepper, and star anise. Saving the marjoram to be added after the rest of these are ground. 
If you're only making enough for a single bottle and don't plan to save any of the spice mixture, the spices can simply be added to the wine without being ground. For ease of use and storage, however, we recommend the use of ground powders so they can easily mix. However you decide to arrive at your powder is up to you. All of these add to a mortar and pestle and grind to a coarse powder. This took Kramer about an hour, and he learned several things along the way. It occurs to me that there must be some sort of method for grinding powders like this efficiently, and I don't know what that is. This is why we experiment, so I can learn what else I need to learn. Take the cardamom pods, for instance. I don't know if you're supposed to take the seed out of the pod itself and just grind that or grind the whole thing. And I suppose in, in hindsight, you could say that I should have looked all of this up before I started the recipe. But um, these are things that didn't occur to me until I was already through the experiment. So like, I'm not sure if we're going to have different chemical reactions based on what order we mix these things in, but I have a feeling probably grinding each of these ingredients separately would have been the way to go. Uh, because at the very least, the size difference in a lot of these ingredients means that I am not grinding all of them equally with the same amount of effort. As I'm thinking about it as well, I'm realizing what may be obvious to some people, but wasn't obvious to me, that different materials that would have been used to make mortar and pestles might have not, I mean, almost definitely were not just regional or aesthetic, but you would use a different type of mortar and pestle um, material for whatever task you were working on. I'm thinking this would be easier if I were using stone um, and I might be completely using the wrong type of, of material for the task that I'm trying to do. And that's why I love doing experiments like this because now I have a whole new rabbit hole of things to learn about that just never occurred to me until I tried to actually grind things in a wooden mortar and pestle. I'd probably be done a lot sooner if I stopped talking every 20 seconds to uh, discuss what I've learned and just grinded the powder. Once the powder is to your satisfaction, add the marjoram and grind that in a bit more. We saved the marjoram because it was already quite fine. Combine all the spices and mix thoroughly. For a bottle of wine, we will use one tablespoon of this mixture. Or for a quart, as the 14th century recipe says, one and a half tablespoon. This recipe also calls for eight ounces of sugar. We will say, add sugar to taste, or use a different sweetener of your choice, such as honey. Add wine, sweet powder, and sweetener into a pot and simmer for about 20 minutes, stirring occasionally. If you boil the mixture, the alcohol will evaporate. Let settle or strain, perhaps with a coffee filter or linen cloth. Lastly, enjoy. That is spicy. Um, and it's not too sweet either. Wow, this is unlike anything, and I've got mulled wine from stores and glue wine and stuff like that. I don't think you can, you can buy a flavor like that. Maybe I messed it up, who knows. So we only ended up using a quarter of a cup of sugar for an entire bottle of wine. Now, I said that I thought maybe we should go for a third of a cup or more, but, um, I actually really like how 
it, it's not dry, but it's, it's, you know, maybe it is dry. It's not dry like a white wine. You kind of have to try it in order to understand, but the, the spices really add a lot of heat. I'm getting the pepper a lot right up front. So I'm getting a lot of heat and the heat sort of persists uh, after you've had the drink for a little bit. It's very warming. I'm getting a lot of the pepper and I think the ginger is coming through an awful lot, even though we didn't cook it for very long at all. Um, I think a lot of the sweeter spice notes from say the cinnamon or the nutmeg or the allspice, I'm, I'm losing those for some reason. Um, and there was a lot of cinnamon. So I think either that means next time uh, I'm gonna cut back on the hotter ones, maybe only use the tiniest bit of black pepper, maybe less ginger, uh, in the hopes that some of those other things come out a little bit. Max Miller with Tasting History said that he tried his at various different temperatures and it changed the uh, taste of the drink drastically. So I suppose I'll have to try that next time. But the experiment I'm going to do, which I'll bet some of you thought, oh, I wonder if this will work, and I'm on the same page as you, uh, I'm gonna try the honey vinegar recipe that I made a couple of episodes ago. Add just a little bit of that into the mulled wine as sweetener, and we'll see how that tastes. And if there's no video next week, it's because the honey vinegar spoiled and I died. <laughs> Kidding. I think we'll be fine. I'm trying to get the ratio right now. That, that was not a scientific measurement by any means. Yeah, the vinegar just sort of adds to the heat. I don't even know if I'm tasting it at all, but the sweetness helps a little bit, I think. Well, my fellow adventurers, Skull, and uh, thank you for joining me today. Not just for this video, but for all the videos previously, and hopefully many more to come. I like this recipe a lot. I'm gonna start drinking it in, in various other weathers other than, uh, other than winter ones. But I like it because if a tea is an infusion, which is just various plant parts that have been steeped in water, then technically mulled wine, I think, is a tincture because it is various plant parts that have been simmered in an alcohol to uh, diffuse. So um, do enjoy, and I will see you all next week. In the meantime, I'd like to wish you good luck on your adventures.